humans and demons have been at war for 15 years, with both sides making raids to seize territories from each other. This has led to ongoing friction and continuous battles between the two races. Amidst this conflict, a hero, Yusha, was born among the humans. He and his three companions fought and won many battles, becoming the hope of humanity to end the war. Perhaps too eager to defeat the Mao, he left his companions and ventured alone directly to Mao's palace. Yusha's original intention was indeed to assassinate Mao. However, upon infiltrating the deepest part of Mao's palace and reaching the throne room, he saw a figure and launched an attack without hesitation. The figure turned around, revealing herself to be a striking red-haired woman. Yusha stumbled and blushed, realizing that this young girl was the 43rd generation Mao, who confirmed her identity with the emblem on her chest. Yusha stepped back, suspecting a trap. He calmed himself, declaring he wouldn't fall for such tricks. Unexpectedly, Mao had no intention of battling him. She revealed that she had been waiting for Yusha, wanting to speak with him for a long time. As soon as she spoke, she said, Become mine, Yusha. Yusha responded that the demon race had initiated the war and destroyed many nations, which he found unforgivable. Mao explained that it was all a misunderstanding. She had only punished those who committed evil acts. Humans always blamed the demon race, she countered, asking if he only saw the demons harming humans and not the other way around. She argued that there is no absolute right or wrong in this world. Mao took out a scroll, ready to discuss with Yusha the benefits that the war had brought. Meanwhile, some celebrated the war against the demons because it had united humanity. The war had alleviated diseases and famines that had persisted for over 500 years and even brought immense wealth to the central continent. When internal strife arises, there are always those who try to ignite wars, and the demon race was no different. Previously engaged in bloody battles for the throne, they now all followed her command. Yusha suggested that if Mao truly did not want to wage war, he could accompany her to surrender. However, Mao insisted the war could not yet end. The border prince, also troubled by the ongoing conflict, did not understand why the war continued. Before the war, his nation had been struggling, but after it began, they received donations from the central nations. Yusha pointed out that these nations were merely donating without benefiting themselves. Mao informed him that at least they gained security. Although surrounded by war, the nations of the central continent lived as if in another world. She handed Yusha a lamp, and as he took it, visions of the affluent life on the central continent appeared before him, where banquets were held every night as if there was no war. Mao explained that it was precisely because of the war that they could live this way. If the war disappeared, the central continent would lose its supply sources, leading to massive unemployment, food shortages, and even starvation. However, war is a double-edged sword. It brings food to nations that lack it, but food does not appear out of thin air. Some gain food while others starve. Without war, the world would have many people who know nothing but fighting and would struggle to survive without food, resulting in millions of deaths. Yusha was incredulous. The truth was indeed as such. Mao stated that regardless of whether the war is won or lost, humanity is headed towards extinction. Therefore, they did not deploy their armies but instead sent Yusha alone. If the demon race were victorious, they would seek slaves and increase their colonies on human territories. Conversely, if humans won, they would do the same on the demon's lands. Yusha wanted to refute Mao, but she told him that many worlds have been destroyed this way. She showed Yusha the scene she had always dreamed of. There were no luxurious palaces or indulgences, just green mountains and clear waters. She wanted to see what the other side of a world without war looked like. To pursue this dream, she needed Yusha to become hers. In return, she would discuss giving half of the world's territories to Yusha. Initially, Yusha wanted to refuse, but after hearing Mao's analysis, he realized he no longer wanted to fight. Besides half of the autonomous regions, Mao offered herself to Yusha. She also wanted all of Yusha. Yusha blushed at this. Mao quietly told Yusha that if she declared the end of the war, the human kings would not agree and would likely select another from the demon race and name them Mao. It shows that both sides need the war. However, Mao wanted to change all that, a hope unprecedented for the 3,000 worlds. She needed more than just Yusha's help to stop the war. 
She also had a great fondness for him and wanted someone to accompany her to see the scenery of the world's other side after the war. Yusha blushed again. Mao also felt a bit insecure, believing she didn't possess the physical attributes, personality, or facial features that men found attractive, such as having lots of excess flesh on her hands. However, she had one advantage. She would never betray him. Whether Yusha was sick or old, she would always stay by his side. She belonged to Yusha. Thus, Yusha agreed to become Mao's person, and the two signed a contract. Mao happily hugged Yusha, who shyly pushed her away. Mao stated that the first issue to tackle was the food problem. At that moment, Mao took off the horns on her head, which turned out to be merely decorative. Mao needed Yusha to accompany her on trips to various places to observe and solve the food problem in person. Disguised, the two arrived at a peaceful small village, lush with foliage and livestock. Maid Chu had prepared a house there in advance and concealed Mao's real identity, proclaiming to the villagers that they were there for agricultural research. Maid Chu had taken care of Mao since she was a child and was very happy to hear about Mao's marriage to Yusha. The two immediately expressed shyly that it was just an indefinite contract, but to Chu, this was equivalent to marriage. Meanwhile, rumors circulated outside that Mao and Yusha were both gravely injured after their great battle, with Mao recuperating in the palace and Yusha's whereabouts unknown. Mao actually had knowledge of agriculture and even prepared for crop rotation every season, with each time and each plot having different seeds. After rotation, the land could rest, and the plants grown could nourish the soil and feed the livestock. This planting method was very suitable for areas lacking land, since land development would definitely lead to disputes. Their goal was to eliminate famine. However, the village chief was an unreasonable person and did not quite agree with their plan. Mao decided to first spread knowledge among everyone. Back at home, Mao asked Yusha to sit by her side by the fire. Shyly, Mao offered that Yusha could rest his head on her lap. Yusha didn't hesitate and laid down immediately, as he was already Mao's person. It was then that Mao reached out and stroked his hair. Just as their relationship seemed to become more intimate and they were about to kiss, the horses outside suddenly neighed. They rushed out and found a pair of sisters in the stable, soaked through. Chu came over and said that these were likely slaves from the neighboring village. Yusha detested the slave system finding it barbaric and cruel. However, Mao knew these people were serfs, who differed from ordinary slaves. They could own personal belongings, houses, and agricultural tools, and even live with their families. But they lacked the right to choose their profession or relocate, and were the main labor force of the estate, bound to work ceaselessly. Normally, if they encountered runaway slaves like these, they would notify the estate owner to come and retrieve them. Yusha felt that sending them back was too cruel. Cho, however, told Yusha that people without choices were no different from insects. If they harbored these two, it could be dangerous for everyone in the village. Still, Mao didn't order her to contact anyone right away. Instead, she had Cho prepare some clothes and food, letting the two rest for the night. The sisters were very grateful for Mao's help and pleaded with her not to report them the following morning. The younger sister believed they could escape to a big city to live. Cho cruelly pointed out that this was impossible, saying their so-called escape would only endanger those who sheltered them. Just as Yusha was about to speak, Mao shook her head at him. Chu continued, saying that those who cannot control their own fate are no different from insects. But what she despised were people who were content to live like insects. She advised the girls, who apologized for bursting into their home uninvited, then asked Cho how they could become true humans. This time, Cho didn't rebuke them, but told them that no bowing or kneeling was necessary. A proper, elegant greeting was enough. Turning to Mao, Chu asked if she could hire someone new, as she was overwhelmed with work. Yusha joked that she just said how much she disliked these people. Chu clarified that what she hated were insects, not people. And as a maid, she didn't dislike them. Eventually, the sisters stayed. The younger sister was tasked with delivering bread to Yusha and now, under Mao's guidance, was learning to read and write, aiming to earn a lot of money to live happily with her elder sister. This made Yusha very emotional, feeling like he hadn't accomplished much. The younger sister, looking at a giant boar behind them, commented that Yusha was being too modest. Yusha mentioned that he was only skilled with the sword. Meanwhile, Mao was holding a class, 
attracting people to attend. Someone asked about the Central Kingdom's expeditionary force, an army deployed to exterminate the demon race. Mao stated that the existence of the expeditionary force had two purposes, to end the war and to transport the economy. However, two nobles in the class doubted this, believing that under the Lord's control, no one would starve. An older sister in the class who was also attending expressed her pain, saying that these people had obviously never experienced hunger, which saddened Mao. She had intended to spread knowledge but didn't expect that humans, especially children, would be so difficult to enlighten. Afterwards, Yusha accompanied Mao to continue attending classes at the village chief's house. He had temporarily won over the nobles, who were now willing to farm according to his methods. It was estimated that the results would be visible by next year. Three months had passed since they started attending classes, and the land was indeed beginning to nurture new plants. The villagers gradually started to believe in Mao's words and would greet them warmly on the road. Yusha felt wistful, wishing he too could farm. Later, Yusha took Mao to a city where a church was located. This church worshipped the spirit of light, and people from nobles to slaves deeply believed in the existence of spirits. Yusha did not believe in spirits, but he had a favorable impression of the church because it taught people to read and write, and even helped research some peculiar existences. For this reason, the church had more influence than the king. Mao expressed her anticipation for the church's organizational power. When the two arrived inside the church, they did not notice someone observing them through a window. While Yusha and Mao were chatting, a nun suddenly rushed in. Hearing Yusha claim to be a swordsman, she looked up angrily and uttered the name Yusha. Yusha then realized that this nun was the female knight from his previous team. Yusha had left without telling them, planning to kill Mao on his own, which had worried the female knight and the other teammates. Seeing him now, she slapped him and then asked him about the beautiful woman he was now protecting. Mao explained that she had found Yusha after they had both been severely injured in battle. He stayed to repay her by serving as her guard. It turned out that the female knight had reported Yusha's departure to Mao's castle. A month later, a messenger told them that Yusha had fiercely struck Mao with his sword, but his fate was unknown, allowing their companions to receive a reward. However, the female knight said that a female magician had followed in Yusha's footsteps and had gone to the demon world alone. Yusha was shocked, admitting his mistake, but he believed that the female magician was not in danger due to her strength. Mao and Yusha had come to promote potatoes to the monastery. They had previously prepared potato dishes for others to try. The female knight tasted one and found it delicious. Mao stated that this plant was highly nutritious, resilient, and produced three times the yield of wheat. However, it was poisonous if it sprouted, so it needed to be handled with care. If stored properly, it could help many hungry people. Unfortunately, the nun could not provide funds to help. Mao was not there to ask for money. She hoped the monastery would build a small church in the village where she was conducting her experiments to teach local farmers how to increase their productivity. Ideally, more monasteries would be built to promote this farming method to everyone. She hoped to grow more food and stop the war. The female knight was moved and willing to help, even preparing to personally visit the experimental village. This left Yusha quite flustered. However, Mao did not panic, instead welcoming her warmly. The atmosphere between the two women quickly became tense, as Mao thought the female knight was Yusha's ex-girlfriend, seemingly jealous. Continuous farming could also damage the land, needing external nutrients to be replenished regularly. Ideally, they would enrich the soil with manure. Yusha suggested he could move to the seaside to buy fish. Mao said this would be too troublesome, and the largest fish-supplying city was controlled by a demon who was difficult to deal with. Most importantly, this demon's allies included the southern independent city and free merchants, forming an economic alliance. That place nearly encompasses all the merchants of the central continent, with its economic assets reaching astronomical figures. Yusha suddenly remembered that he had once given a speech in the south. Mao pondered that there should be a reward of several hundred gold coins, but Yusha, with a pained expression, mentioned only fifteen coins. Reflecting on this, he felt truly useless. Afterwards, Mao secluded herself for two months, during which she developed a compass that could guide one in any location. The merchants of the alliance couldn't get enough of it, but they decided to probe Mao's depths. Recently, 
It was said that Mao was still practicing with the monastic order, making them worry about monopolizing the benefits of the compass. A group of them even considered negotiating to secure a share of the compass's profits, as they lacked the strength to assassinate anyone. In the village, hunters would bring food to the maid sisters, who, despite their different backgrounds, greatly admired Mao and those around her, causing maid Ane some melancholy. One night, Yusha, fully armed and unable to sleep out of concern for the female magician, prepared to venture to the demon realm to find her. Mao provided him with a letter for his journey to the demon realm. Before leaving, recalled what Cho had told her. Yusha was clearly a virgin and should let Mao take the initiative. Yusha, very shy, said he would speak after the war. Mao, however, mentioned that she had been here for half a year without gaining a decisive advantage. Yusha was even bringing luggage to visit girlfriend number. Two, how could she not be jealous? Facing Mao's request for a kiss, Yusha only dared to shyly kiss her forehead before hurriedly running off with the items Mao had given him, while Mao said she would always wait for his return. Cho was preparing new clothes for Mao as the Merchants' Alliance arrived for negotiations. The female knight, upon hearing that Yusha had run off to find the female magician, smashed the luggage in anger and caught a group of naive nobles for intense training. Chu worried about Mao's safety and could only pray for Yusha's swift return. Mao stated that at crucial moments, they could flee, as they always relied on Yusha. Meanwhile, the merchants indeed wanted to secure the compass through negotiations, but had prepared for the worst. The demon tribe was already lurking outside, and Mao dressed up to command presence. The compass was merely a prop to lure these people. What she truly wanted to promote was corn. What a pair of food weapons, Mao did not hide. She directly told these two that corn could grow in arid, barren lands, areas of the central continent yet to be developed. Although it would cost money to send people to plant it, it was a huge business opportunity. If they could establish new villages on these barren lands, those villages would become complete pawns of the Merchants' Alliance, a vast market. Besides corn, wood, salt, iron, and cloth, the local villagers would purchase other things, essentially buying from Mao the concept of how to plant these items. The Merchant Alliance didn't understand why she was doing this, since once the concept was sold, they could develop it further without Mao's help. Mao stated that her goal wasn't those items. Her aim was to end the war as soon as possible. The merchants immediately stated that the war couldn't end unless humanity won. Mao believed that was just an external viewpoint. Their alliance was the war's biggest donor. He made a gesture behind his back, and the assassins lurking outside immediately received orders. However, every move they made was observed by the demon tribe's ghosts and reported back to Cho. While the merchants spoke of fighting for humanity's victory, in reality, they were just profiting from the war, merely putting on a righteous facade. Today, Mao's straightforward exposure left them unable to save face. Mao openly admitted that he was not siding with anyone and was only plotting for his own interests. Faced with interests, how could a merchant refuse? The merchant laughed and dropped all pretenses. The benefits Mao offered were enough to tempt him, so a contract was signed by both parties. When the assassins saw the signal, they also withdrew. The merchant greatly admired Mao and even asked if he could propose to Mao which left Mao dumbfounded, just as she was about to explain. The merchant then admitted his rashness, acknowledging he hadn't brought enough dowry, and looked forward to meeting Mao again. Meanwhile, Yusha went out and almost lost his wife. Even though Mao refused, the merchant did not plan to give up. At the same time, the old man and Yusha's team received information about potatoes and the construction of windmills and water systems. Their nation was not very wealthy and lacked water. The prince thought that if the war ended, he hoped the buildings of the monastic order could be promoted in their area. However, once the war ceased, the funding from various nations would stop, and their country would be the first to perish. Mao was also revising the documents of the demon tribe. Half a year had passed, and Yusha had still not returned. Although he wrote letters saying he had saved some elves, and fought a fierce battle with a fire dragon who admired him and wanted to marry off the princess to him, this made Mao anxious. If Yusha dared to betray, she would be the first to bite him. What Mao did not know was that Yusha always came back. He wrote the letters from home. Cho noticed he was avoiding Mao, although she did not know why. She still respected Yusha's thoughts. 
Yusha also had teleportation magic and could come back once a week if he wanted. But his absence worried Mao. Yusha realized that Mao did not really depend on him. Initially, when they first met, she always wanted him to be her person. At first, he thought Mao wanted to use his power to clear the rebels among the demons. But Mao never used his power and even cherished him, not wanting him to fight recklessly. Yet the contract was mutual, and the thought of Mao crying if he died accidentally troubled him deeply. Chu pointed out that since he had signed a contract and belonged to Mao, all his feelings and thoughts should also belong to Mao, reminding Yusha of this. That day, Mei Demuto noted that the town fair was soon, and she looked forward to Yusha coming back to dance with Mao. Meanwhile, on the southern front line where humans and demons clashed, the prince could not help but curse the expeditionary force. They were even considering naval battles against small islands occupied by demons for the sake of interests, risking over 7,000 lives for their ambitions. Ain also wanted to learn fighting, admiring the female knight, and even built a large glass house in the village, nearly exhausting her funds. Although Ani had learned a lot recently and everyone was kind to her, she still wondered if she truly qualified as a dignified human being. The church also insisted on taking back Aurora Island, having spent a lot of money there. Not fighting would lose public support, and the battle might even affect the election of the Pope. The Merchants' Alliance made many compasses, hoping that if they won the war and reclaimed Aurora Island, they could secure the western sea routes. Meanwhile, Mao had ordered a large amount of herring from them, claiming it could be used to nourish the fields. These despicable merchants are essentially profiting from war. The battle for Aurora Island has been taken over by another general, who criticized the previous commander's tactics before even starting the war. The prince feels that with such command, defeat is inevitable. On the land taken from the demon tribe by humans, soldiers were found brazenly oppressing a demon girl serving drinks. Thankfully, Yusha stepped in just in time to stop them. From the demon girl, Yusha learned that those who had bullied him were part of the expeditionary forces stationed troops. Four army units rotate into the city, each committing egregious acts upon their return. Those who stay in the city, of noble birth, mercilessly bully the demon tribe in their safe haven because the demons had lost and were to be trampled upon. Yusha couldn't believe it. Was this the result of his efforts? If humans won, would all demons end up like this? Or if the demons won, would the situation simply reverse? Yusha kept gathering intelligence, pondering what Mao would do. The demon girl led him eastward and asked why, as a human, he was loyal to Mao. Yusha explained that although he belonged to Mao, it wasn't because he lost to her. Victory wasn't an excuse to oppress others. Like Mao, he was seeking the best way forward. Meanwhile, the southern nations were forced into war. Over 200 ships sailed, soon attacked by giant squids around the small islands, dragging the first two commanders into the sea. The prince's father died in battle, and those clamoring for war unrelentingly blamed the prince's father, insisting on buying new ships to continue fighting. The prince declared that his father died, upholding his beliefs. But the current incompetent command was what truly led to the death of 6,000 soldiers. The prince decided to take his father's place and restart the war, believing the unfolding events were his fault. If he hadn't pushed Yusha to the front lines initially, things might not have turned out this way. He intended to inherit the legacies of Yusha and his father to bring light to the nation. Before he left, he summoned the female knight, who took her leave from Mao. Mao admitted her role in the war, having supplied the compasses and food. The female knight, one of Mao's rare female friends aside from Chu, accepted Mao's confession. Unexpectedly, the knight, acting in the name of the Light Elves and as a nun, forgave Mao quickly. What Mao didn't know was that Yusha had met with the female knight alone before leaving, and had already revealed the truth about Mao. The knight stated that although Mao and Yusha had a contract, she had another with Yusha and would never betray him. Therefore, she would trust those Yusha trusted and was prepared to befriend Mao openly, wishing no harm to anyone. In the evening, Mao did not attend the banquet. Instead, she stayed at home alone. It had been a year since she last saw Yusha, and all she could do was pull out a body pillow of him to keep her company. She longed to hear Yusha praise her again. Unexpectedly, at that moment, Yusha's voice suddenly reached her. 
complimenting her for doing a great job. After being moved by his words, Mao, in a rush of emotion, grabbed the body pillow and knocked Yusha to the ground. She demanded to know where he had been all year, upset that he had only written letters and not visited her. Yusha hurriedly explained that he had been busy with the affairs of the Open Gate City, figuring out how to transport supplies to the fortress and finding ways to weaken the extremists. He mentioned that many people there were trying hard to live their lives and he couldn't just destroy their efforts. Mao became angry, suspecting that Yusha's popularity with women had made him too proud. Yusha began to feel aggrieved, mentioning that nobles and merchants had proposed to him which troubled him deeply. Mao declared that she had a clear conscience, and at this, Yusha showed a pitiful face. The two of them didn't feel any awkwardness despite the long separation. As the music from the New Year's celebration outside wafted in, they began to dance in the hall. Mao was about to kiss Yusha, but just then, the music outside stopped. Their actions were driven by emotion but stopped by propriety. Yusha then donned black armor, preparing to return. They agreed to meet again next month when the Open Gate City would be operational. Meanwhile, Mao was about to head to the Arctic Island to assist, while Yusha, now at the Open Gate City, deep within demon territory, had transformed into an undead knight. He used illusions to scare the people, along with nightmares sent specifically to terrorize the expeditionary forces. On the other side, the female knight and the old man had become temporary generals in this battle. At the Open Gate City, the nobles were so terrified by nightmares that they begged to be recalled home. Neither money, wine, nor the demon female slaves at headquarters could keep them there. They were infuriated and expressed their unwillingness to stay in a city filled with the stench of demons. When Mao walked into the command tent, the old man's eyes widened in surprise, and the female knight broke into a cold sweat. Had Mao's identity been discovered? Unexpectedly, the old man, who turned out to be a rogue, shyly expressed a desire to check her bust size, which led the female knight to knock him out cold. The prince only knew of Mao as a scholar who helped their country grow food. Mao was curious why the prince was insistent on retaking the Arctic island at this time. The prince explained that it was to restore his father's honor and regain control over the sea routes, which would enable their nation to trade and become economically independent, no longer needing to fight wars on command from the central authorities. Mao promised to give the prince a gift and brought with her six carts of expensive salt, essential for their campaign. The salt was needed to melt the ice layer, making it stronger for them to walk on as they advanced towards the island. This salt in exchange gave them a whole day where they did nothing. Mao stated that what she sought was not victory, but something that victory alone could not bring. Upon hearing of the humans' landing, the demon tribe on the island sent out squids again, turning the sea almost red with blood. With the foundation laid, the squids were slain, coloring the ice and the sky with hues of blood. They broke through the demon tribe's second line of defense, with around 500 casualties. But there are many natural caves on the island. The fortress, hidden in the deepest part. In the castle, there is also the fiercest warrior of the demon tribe, with an estimated 8,000 demons present. To conquer such a fortress, they would need at least three times that number on their side. They knew Mao had a plan. Suddenly, from behind the Aurora Island, a teleportation array brought nearly 10,000 soldiers. Indeed, they were the noble expeditionary force frightened away by Yusha from the open gate city. The expeditionary force, terrified by Yusha's identity as an undead knight, claimed they were running to provide reinforcements for Aurora Island. As for the merchants in the Open Gate City who trafficked military supplies, he felt they were colluding with the demons and did not wish to protect them. Blocked by his aides, in anger, he tossed the commander's responsibilities onto them. With over 10,000 expeditionary troops gone, the new commander and deputy had no way to protect the humans here. They could only bow to the local demons and establish a new government. From today, this place would no longer be a human territory, but a city of exchange between humans and demons. The prince had thought this was the best chance for a surprise attack, but at this moment, Yusha suddenly appeared. The female knight immediately ran over joyfully. Yusha quickly pulled her back, scratching his head awkwardly towards Mao. Mao's goal was to make the demon see the situation clearly and preferably choose to retreat, but then the fierce warrior ran over. Initially, Yusha was prepared to act, 
but the female knight stated that now it was her mission. This fierce warrior was a giant seal. Both of them indeed had considerable strength. As they continuously fought, the female knight struck down the seal general with a single sword blow. Cheers erupted from everyone. However, the female knight stated they couldn't be too happy now. They still had to search the island to see if any demon remnants remained. Seeing her own kind killed, the female knight was still saddened. Yusha wrapped his arm around her shoulder. On this side, the prince had taken Aurora Island in the evening, during the victory banquet. He specifically honored Mau and the female knight with titles. The old man specifically went to find Yusha. He said Yusha was too strong, and ordinary people could not accept him. His power would make people fearful. The old man knew that Yusha had left to prevent them from being treated the same way. But in the old man's view, Yusha was also a person. They were sorry to leave Yusha alone. After the separation, the old man worked hard, directly assisting the prince, hoping that those responsibilities would not fall on Yusha. He also hoped Yusha could find his own place. Now it was autumn, Yusha and Mao had a chance to be alone, but the female knight always found various excuses to check on them. After the prince ascended to power, he led the nation's economy towards positive development, and the apprentices Mao had taught were also sent to assist the prince. But Ane still had unresolved issues. On the other side, the female knight was practicing swordplay with Yusha. Both of them were drenched in sweat and ran directly to the well to splash water. The female knight, who had a crush on Yusha, didn't hold back and started washing up without her top, making Yusha somewhat embarrassed. Sitting and viewing the courtyard scenery, the female knight wished it could always be like this. Having strong combat capabilities could completely end the war, but the problem is, regardless of who wins, after the war there would still be no true peace. But Ma'o wanted to save both humans and demons, so Yusha greatly admired Ma'o. The female knight felt defeated. Yusha mentioned that the female knight had been making impressive changes to the people's welfare recently. Imudo heard from Mao that after the carbonated water, they even managed to create an orange-flavored soda. Mao reflected that this child might become a fine chef in the future, which made Imudo very happy. Recently, the Open Gate City is organizing an exchange meeting. Yusha will represent Mao to attend and communicate. The commander left in Open Gate City had a good reputation previously and was the leader of the eastern fortresses. Therefore, even when the expeditionary forces left, many demons in Open Gate City still respected them. Yusha and the commander of Open Gate City became friends. They drank and ate meat together when the Dragon King's daughter and a demon girl came looking for them, insisting on calling themselves Yusha's wives. However, at that moment, the earth suddenly shook. Even Mao, who stayed in the experimental village, felt it. Chu looked very upset. Mao said it had been two years already and she was satisfied to have delayed this long. She asked Cho to pack up and move her bed to the demon palace, saying she would return soon and not to worry. Not long after, Mao took Ani with her, asking Yusha to teleport them to the Iron Kingdom. Mao said that Ani was very smart, smarter than some nobles and merchants, so she has been guiding Ani to learn more. Knowledge alone can make people realize the stakes in the world. So Mao is preparing to spread knowledge using the printing press she created in the Iron Kingdom, which can print thousands of sheets of paper a day. Yusha admired this greatly and then fell into a deep sleep. Late at night, the female knight, bringing tea, came to Yusha's room and coincidentally met Mao. The two argued, and at this moment, Cho kicked them into the room, starting a three-person living arrangement. Eventually, they each chose a side of the bed, with Yusha in the middle being petted like a dog. However, Mao told the female knight that she would return to the Mao palace next week to pay homage to the tombs of past Maos. Without proper governance of the demons, some radical factions might provoke wars, as most in the demon world still favor conflict. The female knight thought this was too risky. Mao mentioned that aside from him, no one could enter the Mao tomb, but Cho would wait for him outside. Before leaving, he left a lot of materials, knowing the maid sisters would know what to do. He entrusted the female knight to take good care of Yusha. The next day, Yusha expressed a desire to go with Mao. Knowing that other countries were also restless recently, Mao knew Yusha needed to stay. She gave a ring to Ane, which could disguise her as Mao, because without him, others might not trust Ane in dealings. 
Yusha sent Mao and Cho back to the demon world, promising they would meet again soon.